Welcome back to Take 5, Basic Survival and Film and Fieldcraft. I'm Dr. Glenn Barnes with the UT Tyler School of Nursing. Today's, or this session, is going to be on water. Water, we cannot express how important water is. It is absolutely vital. Within a few hours of dehydration, your thought processes start to alter. You make bad choices, which can make a bad situation worse. On the opposite side, if you get too much water and you start depleting your electrolytes, you can be in trouble again. So either way is bad for you. You have to find a good balance between enough water to keep you hydrated with enough salts to keep you functioning. So we're gonna be looking at the physiological effects of water in, in us humans. We're gonna look at the meta methods for water procurement and for water purification. Now, physiological, it is a basis essential for life after air. So the effects of dehydration, again, can start within hours. And a lot of us are not fully hydrated when we start. So if you're already behind the power curve and a bad situation arises, you're going to be expending a lot of energy, burning up a lot of, of your cellular water, and putting yourself at risk for dehydration even faster. Now, for planning purposes, we're going to say that a normal adult human being needs one gallon of water per day, and that's to meet your metabolic needs plus some basic hygiene. That's nothing extravagant. That's just, and, and that is with a moderate amount of expenditure. If you're having to do a heavy workload for whatever reason, then that amount is going to go up. Again, you also have to supplement with some salts. And don't forget your pets. You are going to have to have water for your pets, and you're going to have to be able to look at other uh, hygiene needs for medical cleaning. A lot of things that factor into this. So whenever you plan on how much water you want, double it. So water loss can happen through just by respiration. We could breathe out a lot of water, and that is moisture from our lungs. Perspiration, obviously, um, you're going to pee off water. And so things that are diuretics, such as the love of my life, coffee, is going to make that worse. Medical situations such as diarrhea, vomiting, serum osmolarity changes. We'll get into that with the water intoxication. And certain medications and, and chemicals can draw water from your body. So again, drinking water is just not enough. You also need to replace your electrolytes. You can put yourself in what's called an exercise-induced hyponatremia, which means that you have taken in water and you have expelled out salts, but you're not replacing those salts. So for your muscles to, to respond, you have to shift electrolytes back and forth across the, those membranes. And if you don't have those electrolytes on one side of the membrane, then the electrolytes on the other aren't going to cross over because it's all part of that positive negative charge that they have. So you have to, have to, have to make sure that you have adequate electrolytes as well as adequate water. So you, again, if you're working hard, if you're trying to move out of an area that has had a disaster, if you're helping other people, your water needs are going to increase. So let's talk about water procurement. Where do you get water? Now, obvious sources like from a lake, a stream, from a faucet, uh, uh, any kind of place that has stored water is relatively easy. It's there, but it's not necessarily drinkable. So we'll get that into water purification. But don't overlook an obvious deal of a faucet that would give you water, but don't assume that even water out of a faucet is safe to drink because you don't know what kind of piping it's come from. You don't know if you're looking at a gray water tap. You just don't trust any water source that you are not 100% sure of. So a solar still, we'll get into what a solar still is, what transpiration is, and Yes, you can get water from mud. It's not great, but you can do it. So let's look at the solar still. This is a way of using evaporation and perspiration and, and transpiration to your benefit. 
So as the slide shows, you dig a hole, you put a container in, in the bottom of it, you put some leafy greens in there, and that will expel the CO2, which will mix and form water along the inside. But you need heat. You need, it's a solar still. It works during the daytime. So you put a little pebble into the plastic sheet, and it collects on the underside of that plastic sheet and then drips down. You're not going to get a lot of water. You, if you have to rely on a solar still for water, you better put up three, four, ten of these things, as many as you can, because you're not going to get that much water. You're talking maybe about a half cup to a cup a day uh, per still. So that's not even getting you close to what you need. But the good thing is, as long as your plastic sheeting is clean and your collection container, container is clean, your water will be clean. Another form of collecting water is called transpiration. This is where you collect water from trees, mostly broadleaf, and you put a clear plastic bag over a group of the leaves that are on the tree, and the tree's metabolic process plus the sun's heat will form perspiration from on the inside of the bag and or transpiration and then will collect in the bottom of the bag. You need a clear plastic bag. The other types won't work. We've tried white, black, other colors. Uh, really the best one that works is the clear plastic bag. And it'll give you about a cup more or less a day. Again, not going to be great, but if you put several of these out, it is a way of creating water. You must purify this water because there's un unknown contaminants on the leaves. Whatever's on the leaf is dripping down into your water. So this water you do have to purify. So water from mud. Look for places that water would settle. So low parts in creek, even if it's a dry creek bed, look at, a, at bends in the creek or at the base of plants and start digging. If a plant is green and moist, then there's water there somewhere and you'll have to dig it up. From there, you have to strain and, and, and squeeze it out and then run it through a purification system. Usually on that, you'll have to run it through several, but if you can get down deep enough to get groundwater, then that will be a source of water that you can pull. Now, before I get into water purification, I do want to hit salt again. Your electrolytes, this is a company called Base Performance and it's electrolyte salt. And this is one that is used by a lot of ultra marathon people. It has sodium, chloride, calcium, magnesium, potassium. So all the good salts that you need in a small container. Now you do have to be careful with this is that it, it's a small amount and they think, oh, it's a small amount and they'll take the whole thing. And now they've just overloaded their system with these electrolytes and they cause themselves more problems. So. There's instructions on there. It's a small dime size at a time, and there's several servings in this little tube. So make sure that when you're using these salts, you understand how to use them and what your, your concentration is for these salts and how much of them that you use at any given time. Another good option is just good old Himalayan sea salt. It can sprinkle in. It's not going to give you a lot of the potassiums and the other, but it does have good minerals in there. So that's what you're looking for. Now, on to water purification. Different methods for purifying water, each of them have their pros and cons. You have chemical filtration, de distillation, and then just boiling or heating the water. So, chemical purification. Two main chemicals that are used in most of your purifying, chlorine and iodine. And when we start looking at Chlorine is as literally just either household bleach or you can even use what is known as pool shock. It's a, a sodium hypochlorite that's used for pools. Big caveat on this one, you have to know your concentrations. You have to know how to use this because you cannot just start throwing bleach into there. If you get your concentrations wrong, you're going to make people sick or you could kill them. Right? So household bleach is usually about eight to 10 drops, depending on how cloudy and nasty the water is. Also depends on the concentration of the chlorine. So if you look at chlorine bottles, the chlorine concentration can range from 2.5 to 8%. So judging from a 5% 
sodium hypochlorite is, will give you the eight to 10 drops per gallon. And then you can uh, gauge if it's 2.5, you have to double that. If it's eight, you're gonna have to back down on that. Also understand that household bleach does off gas its chemicals over time so that it's not indefinite use. So if it's really, really old, it may not be as effective. Iodine, iodine has been a gold standard for the military for a long time. It's easy, the pills, as long as they're sealed, will last for or almost forever. And they, but it does also have a couple bad things with it. One, if you have an iodine sensitivity, you probably don't wanna put iodine in your water. Two, that if you use too much iodine, you can cause yourself some thyroid problems, or if you already have thyroid problems, iodine is probably not what you wanna use. Now, what is commercially available is these iodine tablets with a neutralizer. And this neutralizer, I have seen the iodine turn the water a pinkish color, and then the neutralizer goes in and, and binds up the excess iodine, takes the iodine taste out, and clears the water up. It worked out really, really well. So if you're gonna use iodine, you have no, no reasons not to, then also make sure you get the kit that's got the iodine neutralizer to neutralize the excess iodine. Another chemical that is out there that is not listed is potassium permanganate. That can be used to sterilize water, but understand that you really have to know your chemistry to know how much to put in there. Uh, you can make it antibacterial, you can make it antifungal. So if you're wanting to use potassium permanganate, you put enough in there to make it a very light pinkish tint because the, the potassium permanganate is a reddish powder, a darker pink to red will make it antibacterial, antimicrobial, and then a deep red makes it antifungal. So a lot of uses for potassium permanganate, but again, heavy caveats with that. So please do your research if, if, you're, gonna, if you're going to just start out, then buy the pills from the store that use the iodine and have the neutralizer and just buy the kit and work it that way. Filter purification, commercial and improvised. Let's just talk about improvised first. It will filter large particulates out if you're improvising a filter. How do you improvise a filter? You have multiple layers of gravel, grass, sand, and then the very final layer is charcoal. And you can get charcoal from your campfire, break it up, crumble it up, make that your last layer. That will filter out quite a bit, and it beats if you have absolutely nothing else. But it is not gonna work against protozoas and viruses. Your commercial filters, you need to look at those. There's a lot of really good names out there. My personal favorite is Sawyer. They are an absolute 0.1 micron filtration, which means that it's not a up to 0.1, and you can have other size holes in there, microfibers. It is every fiber in there is 0 0.1 micron, which means that no viruses get in, no protozoas, it'll filter out everything. And it, you can, if it starts to get sludge, they bring in the kit, it'll back flush it. Each little filter will last about 10,000 gallons and they run about 20 bucks. So with the filters, different deals, I've got the one gallon bags that they come in. I also have 32 and 64 ounce bags. I really like how they have their setup. So if you buy the, the kit, buy the full kit, it's got a container. If you're gonna be providing for a family, get the gallon container. You fill up a gallon of lake water and just filter it through the, the Sawyer Mini or Micro or whichever filter you, you do buy. Uh, the squeeze is nice because you can fill up other containers with that under a small bill of bit of manual pressure. Another uh, type of chemical, I just saw this here, are these little tablets here. Each one of these will filter one liter of water. This is a great little way, they're sealed, so you can, and they're flat. You can, you can fit these in any kit, any glove box. These little filters also bought at a local store are, are wonderful if you don't wanna worry about the size and awkwardness of this, you could just slip these into a glove box easy, no problem.
Oh, let me back up with filters. Also, there are some that are hand pump generated. Again, those are just fine. Look at your situation. How many people are you providing for? How many gallons are you going to need to to give out? How does it draw from that water? Are you going to act actually? There's um, a live straw, very good water filter. It is a personal filter. It means that you put your face into the close to the water and suck the water through the straw. But it works, and it's lightweight, and it's easy to carry. Everybody needs to carry one versus some of the other that are hand pump generated or some drip filters. So really look at, at what your needs are and get the best filter you can buy because this is one area you do not want to scrimp on. You want to get the best filter that you can afford that fits your lifestyle, fits your needs, fits your operational environment. You don't want to necessarily get a huge reverse osmosis filter system if it's just you or one or two people and your water sources are not horrible and you may not have the power to run a, a reverse osmosis system. Distillation purification. Distillation is one of the purest ways to get the purest water out there because you're basically taking the water, you're converting it to steam, having it condensing from a coil and then come out as just pure water. We'll even work on seawater. The issue is that it takes a lot of power to generate to create that steam. So you have to have a lot of fuel to boil this water to make enough steam to make the, make the water that pure. Again, if you're looking at just seawater, you've got no other choice but to have some kind of distillation process. So heat purification, you can do it by boiling. Most of us remember in Tyler and in most of North Texas, when the Arctic vortex hit down, it took out a lot of the power stations that supply power to our water purification. And cities like Tyler went on a water boil alert, which means you had to boil your water to make sure that it was safe. To do that, you want to make sure you had a rolling boil and technically, one minute is good. I personally would not trust one minute. I would take it three to five minutes. If you're not in a big hurry, let it run for five minutes at a rolling boil to make sure that you have absolutely killed everything in that water and then let it cool down and you're good to go. Other ways of distillation is through a radiation style. So solar radiation. You can take the water in a clear container, set it out for six to eight hours, and the UV rays will sterilize that water. Another way of doing it is to buy a commercial UV water sterilizer. Now I've seen some of these and some of them, I, I have not tried them myself, but they are showing a lot of promise. One particularly has the UV filter, uh, UV emitter in the cap. So you put your dirty water in the bottle, you screw the cap on, and it'll it's supposed to sterilize it within a minute. So have not tried those, have not read the research on those. So if you're looking into those, look into the research, see if there's been studies done, how effective they, that that model is, just because UV sterilization works, doesn't mean that that model was one that they tried. So if you do look for that, like I'm going to, be sure you do your research. It is not worth the trouble that some kind of water contamination is going to cause you. Any questions?